Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Suicide bombing kills nine policemen in Balochistan. Pakistan continues to push narcotics and weapons into India. And Afghan universities reopen women still banned. At least eight security officers and a civilian were killed and several others were wounded when a suicide bomber triggered an explosion by ramming his motorcycle into a police truck in Pakistan's restive southwestern Balochistan province. The blast was reported from Dadar Tehsil of Kachi district, about 150 kilometers east of Quetta, the provincial capital. The security situation in Pakistan Balochistan province continues to worsen. Recently, a bomb blast in the volatile region killed nine policemen and injured several others. This is the latest in a series of attacks on police personnel in Pakistan. No group had immediately claimed responsibility for the attack. However, ethnic Baloch guerrillas have been fighting the government for decades, accusing it of plundering Balochistan's abundant mineral and gas resources. Recent suicide bombings have been connected to Baloch resistance to the China-Pakistan corridor and they also draw attention to the wider conflict for the freedom of Balochistan. Atrocities on Baloch people are proving to be a curse for occupying forces. Pakistan is a state which responds to any calls for reforms with enforced disappearances. In the last decade, Pakistan's own Commission of Inquiry on Enforced Disappearances has received 8,463 complaints. The Baloch people have borne the brunt of this cruel policy. Students, doctors, engineers, teachers and community leaders are regularly disappeared by the state, never to return back. No religious minority can freely live or practice its religion in Pakistan today. Over the years, thousands of people have vanished in Balochistan as a result of a brutal crackdown led by the military. Global media outlets have reported that hundreds of bodies of suspected armed separatists and political activists have been discovered in the unrest-plagued province, pointing to extrajudicial killings by Pakistani security forces. The exploitation of resources and oppression of the populace are what fuel the insurgency. But Pakistan, which is in denial, accuses foreign countries like India and Iran of being responsible, a claim which makes no sense. Baloch separatists have been angry at mining and energy projects in the region. They say there are no benefits for them as most new jobs have gone to outsiders while locals, already battling crushing poverty, are being pushed off their land. Baloch separatists have warned China several times to refrain from looting Baloch resources. However, China continues to be involved in its expansionist designs in Balochistan. Nowadays, Pakistan has been abducting Baloch women. In the last two weeks or more, more than five Baloch women were abducted by Pakistani security forces. Rashida Baloch was skipped in Pakistani torture set for 13 days without any charges and after that she was released but no one knows why she was kept in pakistani torture cell and the same way on uh, 17 uh, uh, of february this month mahal baloch was also abducted from the quota and our whereabouts are still unknown till today so it is our duty to tell the world that what the human right gross human right violation pakistan is committing in the world in balochistan sorry in balochistan and it is the duty of the world that they should Ask the Pakistan, they should question Pakistan about the gross human rights violation in Balochistan. One of the main causes of the insurgency has been the fact that the Baloch and many other ethnic identities have been colonized by the dominant Punjabis, who control not only the central government but also the entire state apparatus and its institutions. The Baloch have been completely alienated from the state as they are numerically inferior since the population is only about 6% of the total population, while the province covers nearly 44% of the state. 
The upcoming days may witness additional bloodshed in Balochistan and elsewhere due to the combative posture of Pakistan, China and the Baloch separatists. The Baloch insurgency can no longer be viewed by Pakistan as a low-intensity conflict. At a time when Pakistan's economy is on the verge of collapse under a huge mountain of debt, China approved a 700 million US dollars credit facility for the insolvent nation. China's age-old practice of debt trap diplomacy has already alerted nations across the world. And now Islamabad will likely to be cognizant of the dangers of becoming increasingly dependent on Chinese loans. Let's take a closer look at China's predatory lending practices and the significance and ramifications of Pakistan's Chinese debt. With the Pakistani rupee depreciating, fuel prices skyrocketing, and taxes on luxury goods rising, Pakistan has long been sliding into a severe economic crisis. The Islamic Republic is doing everything in its power to access the next installment of the IMF's 6.5 billion loan facility. While Pakistan attempts to secure help from the IMF, China extended a 700 million USD loan to Pakistan. The news of the loan from the state-owned China Development Bank broke only a day after Pakistan's National Assembly unanimously passed a bill to increase tax revenues. Islamabad's debt to Beijing will now rise, placing the country in a more precarious and compromised position than ever before. The possibility that Chinese loans to Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and other countries in India's immediate neighborhood could be used as leverage has deeply concerned the United States. U.S. State Department Counselor Derek Cholet stated that we have been very clear about our concerns, not just here in Pakistan, but elsewhere all around the world, about Chinese debt or debt owed to China. United States of America, as of now, I haven't seen a very proactive approach in order to counter this Chinese debt diplomacy. U.S., as of now, because of certain factors, may not be positioned to do it alone. There is a requirement for other countries, like countries from Europe, countries like India. They have to come together in order to look the way the China is trying to shape the international relation as of now. Pakistan, in its 75-year history, has never experienced any meaningful periods of economic stability. Now, with Pakistan struggling with its worst economic crisis in decades, the country is desperate for aid, seemingly pushing any consequences of such aid to the back of the mind. China is already Pakistan's largest creditor, with much of their debt coming under the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor CPEC. Pakistan's debt to China increased from 7.2 billion in 2017 to 19 billion in 2018 and 30 billion in 2020. Data from the IMF shows that China is responsible for 30% of Pakistan's overall foreign debt, or roughly 30 billion. This is greater than its combined borrowings from the World Bank and Asian Development Bank, and is three times as much as its IMF debt. Pakistan has, unfortunately, yet to comprehend the ramifications of the adage, there is no such thing as a free lunch. Money lent from China has many strings attached. Firstly, Beijing lends at higher interest rates than those charged by the IMF and the World Bank. Secondly, the system does not follow the standard lending borrowing procedure, which only magnifies the risk of the borrower in failing to return the amount. When the borrower defaults, it is then that China's tried and true debt diplomacy comes into play. For example, this new Chinese loan to Pakistan comes after China demanded repayment of 55.6 million USD for the Lahore Orange Line project by November 2023. Spiraling deeper into the Chinese trap, Pakistan appears to be blindly following Sri Lanka's path to its worst financial crisis in decades. Pakistan is yet to realize that it is getting entrapped in these very economic claws of China, the same path on which Sri Lanka has got devastated. 
until and unless Pakistan doesn't realize the web that he's entering, the day is not far when Pakistan too will collapse like Sri Lanka did because of the Chinese debt. China has given billions of dollars in the form of concessional loans to developing nations, mostly for large-scale infrastructure projects. When these countries struggle to make the payments, Beijing is able to demand benefits or concessions in exchange for debt relief. For example, Sri Lanka was compelled to cede control of the Hanventota port project to China for 99 years because of its sizable debt to Beijing. This gave China control over a crucial port and a strategic foothold along with critical waterway for trade and military transportation. As we have seen in South Asia, China is steadily increasing its foothold over Africa as well. Moving on. Afghanistan has made the decision to reopen its colleges, but there is a catch. Only male students are allowed to attend the classes. Women are still not allowed to enroll in classes. The ban on university education is one of the several restrictions imposed on Afghan women since the Taliban stormed back to power in August 2021. The all-male interim government imposed the ban accusing female students of ignoring a strict dress code. A report. Another blow for the women in Afghanistan. It's the start of the new university term, but only male students are allowed to attend the classes. Afghan girls are still barred from university education. In December last year, the Taliban announced a ban for women from educational institutes. The Taliban government imposed the ban, accusing female students of ignoring a strict dress code and a requirement to be accompanied by a male relative to and from campus. The decision by the Taliban drew widespread condemnation from foreign governments and the United Nations. The UN mission in Afghanistan asked the Taliban officials to immediately withdraw its decision. However, nothing fruitful was achieved out of it. The Taliban, since seizing power in August 2021, has drastically curtailed women's freedoms and rights. In a report covering July to December 2022, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights, Richard Bennett, found that the Taliban's treatment of women and girls may amount to gender persecution, a crime against humanity. The Taliban's intentional and calculated policy is to repudiate the human rights of women and girls and to erase them from public life. It may am amount uh, to the international crime of gender persecution for which the authorities can be held accountable. The cumulative effect of the restrictions on women and girls has a devastating long-term long impact on the whole population and it is tantamount to gender apartheid. The Taliban, after storming back to power, promised to respect women's rights. But ever since their return, there has been steady streams of setbacks. In March of last year, the Taliban broke their promise to reopen secondary schools for girls. Two months later, women were forced to veil their faces as well as their hair. In September, Women's Affairs Ministry was disbanded. Thereafter, in December, the all-male interim government ordered all foreign and domestic non-governmental groups in Afghanistan to suspend employing women, as some female employees didn't wear the Islamic headscarf correctly. While welcome and necessary in the short-term international hu humanitarian assistance cannot and should not replace a functioning economy and this dependency must be addressed. Instead of intensifying its efforts to remedy the situation, the Taliban continues to interfere in aid delivery. I urge them to immediately cease ap actions that disrupt, disrupt equitable and speedy access to humanitarian aid to those most in need, particularly women and children. The role of women employees is critical in aid delivery. I urge the de facto authorities to immediately lift the ban on women working for NGOs. Afghanistan is the only country in the world where girls are banned from going to high schools 
and effectively banned from political participation. Today, they have imposed a primitive government with harsh rules, erasing centuries of female progress. The hardliners have denied millions of women the right to an education, fired tens of thousands of women from government jobs, and outlawed their businesses and various forms of activism. A recent analysis by the UN Children's Fund found that prohibiting girls from attending high school also has a financial cost, costing the nation 2.5% of its annual GDP. According to UNICEF, if the 3 million girls in the current cohort finish secondary school and enter the workforce, the Afghan economy would grow by at least $5.4 billion. However, it appears that under the current circumstances, their contribution is headed towards zero. Pakistan is not happy with the peaceful atmosphere in Jammu and Kashmir and wants to promote narco-terrorism by luring the youth towards drugs and using the money earned out of narco sale to fuel terrorism. The continuous flow of narcotics, especially heroin from across the border in recent years, is posing serious challenge to security forces in Kashmir. In the latest, Jammu and Kashmir police busted a narco-terror module and recovered 7 kg heroin, nearly 2 crore cash, arms and ammunition from a drug peddler's house near the line of control in Poonch district, a report. Narco-terrorism is an integral component of Pakistan's state sponsorship of cross-border terrorism used as to fund and conduct asymmetric warfare against its neighbours. Over 80% of drugs in India are infiltrating from neighbouring Pakistan. The country's intelligence agencies have been working with terror groups on a kill two birds with one stone strategy to smuggle weapons and narcotics into India through the same routes. Islamabad has been heavily relying on the sale of drugs in Kashmir to fund its terror infrastructure. In the last two years, more than 80% of drugs seized in Jammu and Kashmir were smuggled from Pakistan also for narco-terrorism. The Union Territory has become a soft target for drug mafia as it is being used as a transit route from Pakistan, Afghanistan to Punjab and Delhi. Recently, Jammu and Kashmir police busted a narco-terror module and recovered 7 kg heroin, nearly 200 cash, arms and ammunition from a duck peddler's house near the line of control in Poonch district. तो रफी लाला के बारे में ऑलरेडी पुलिस को काफी इनपुट्स थे कि ये कुछ इल्लीगल एक्टिविटीज और क्रॉस बॉर्डर स्मगलिंग में और नार्को टेररिज्म में इन्वॉल्व हैं तो इस आधार पे पुलिस ने ऑलरेडी उनको फेब्रुअरी के लास्ट वीक में डिटेन किया था अंडर पीएसए जो आपके यहाँ पे पुंच जेल में अभी डिटेन है Pakistan has employed a dual strategy to undermine the social fabric of the valley, delivering both weapons and drugs. The most often used opiate in Kashmir is heroin that is trafficked from Pakistan. Drug trafficking across borders give terrorism financial support and, if not stopped immediately, could damage the lives of the region's children. According to doctors at the Addiction Center in Srinagar City, the arrival of such drug has resulted in heroin abuse, showing an alarming increase in Kashmir in recent years. From 15% heroin abuse recorded in 2016, it has gone up to 95% in 2023. The finances generated from heroin fund separatist activities and spread other centrifugal tendencies. Terror modules that have been busted in the recent past by security agencies show a most significant challenge to society and security. You know that this is the drugs, the heroin, the drugs, the terrorism. This is the whole country. So, the role of our security forces, the main role of our border security forces, is the main role of our border security forces. फिर उसके बाद मेन लैंड में जहाँ पे पुलिस है, तो हम भी अपने हिसाब से पूरे 
मतलब जो है ड्रग्स को प्रायोरिटी नंबर टू पे रखा गया है वन हमारे लिए टेररिज्म है और काउंटर टेररिज्म मेजर्स हैं और टू पे प्रायोरिटी है हमारे लिए ड्रग्स जो आपको मुझे लगता है कि गुजशत कुछ वक्त से देखने को मिल भी रहा होगा The nexus between drug traffickers, criminal networks and terrorists are potent threat. Exploitation of the trafficking routes by terrorists with the help of well-entrenched criminal networks to infiltrate with arms and explosives have added a critical dimension to the security of the borders. Moreover, large-scale availability of narcotics and drugs encourages demand for narcotics and drugs by domestic population. consumption of which produces dysfunctional behavior thereby creating law and order problem in the society therefore india needs to adopt a comprehensive approach to tackle this challenge and with that we come to the end of this edition of news week south asia we'll be back next week with more news views and analysis from the subcontinent Meanwhile do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia Goodbye and take care